Welcome to another edition of Picture of Health. I'm your host, Stephen Barnes, and today we are learning about pulmonary hypertension. Well, pulmonary hypertension is a rare type of high blood pressure that affects fewer than 200,000 U.S. patients per year. Many of the people who have this affliction are undiagnosed because the symptoms are similar to more common diseases, such as the flu. Today in the studio, I'm joined with Angela Mann, an advanced nurse practitioner from the Pulmonary Hypertension Center at Lakeland Regional Health, and Joy Morgan, the leader of the Central Florida Pulmonary Hypertension Support Group. Ladies, thanks so much for coming on today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Now, the pulmonary hypertension, um, you know, a lot of people, when they, when you say high blood pressure, they think of the cuff on the arm, the little stethoscope on their elbow, but this is, this is different. This isn't something that's quite as simple as that. Tell us a little bit about what pulmonary hypertension is. So with normal systemic high blood pressure, it affects the blood vessels in the periphery of the body, whereas pulmonary hypertension affects the blood vessels of the lungs itself. And they're controlled by different chemicals within the body. And so what may affect and cause high blood pressure in the rest of the body does not necessarily cause high blood pressure in the lungs. Okay. And then it's further split out into two forms of pulmonary hypertension within the lungs. And that's between pulmonary arterial hypertension and pulmonary venous hypertension. And the treatment pathways on those are very different. So regular, when people think of the regular blood pressure, it's a totally different completely system. Completely different and completely separate. And there's no overlap between the two. Okay. It's so there, there's no, like, I mean, if you have high blood pressure, systemic high blood pressure, the, the cuff link, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're in danger You have, you have of, no higher risk of having pulmonary high blood pressure necessarily. Okay. So they are completely separate But it doesn't roll diseases. you out either. That is correct. Okay. You can have two diseases at once. So pulmonary hypertension, it seems like it's kind of um, phantom. Like, I mean, how, if you can't just routinely check for pulmonary hypertension, how would somebody know that maybe they're in risk of it? So traditionally there are uh, several different uh, other health groups that are at higher risk to develop pulmonary hypertension, um, particularly groups that have autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, or lupus. Um, there are, in the rest of the world, other parasitic infections like schistosomiasis that can cause it. There are, uh, HIV is also an area where we do see pulmonary hypertension evolving. Pulmonary hypertension then is further split into whether it's pulmonary venous and pulmonary arterial hypertension. And pulmonary venous hypertension is actually quite common and that is associated with things like the systemic hypertension, um, pulmonary diseases, and um, chronic blood clots. So if you, have, if you have one of these other types of, of diseases, then that's a, a good indicator that you should at least get tested for pulmonary uh, certainly. hypertension. Certainly, and then it's the fine pulling out of, of high degree of suspicion. Do we can continue with uh, looking for more diagnostics and then determine is it pulmonary arterial or pulmonary venous hypertension to determine which pathway to treat them on. Okay. Um, it, it's a difficult disease to treat because it looks like everything else. It, it, the primary symptoms are a little bit of dizziness, fatigue, mm -hmm. uh, shortness of breath, maybe some chest pain, maybe some swelling in the neg legs. And those are very common in many other diseases, particularly congestive heart failure and COPD and um, even deconditioning. You see a lot of those uh, symptoms. So it makes it a difficult disease to find because it looks like everything else. Mm -hmm. Now, Joy, um, as part of the support group for the PH uh, Association, mm -hmm. you've experienced some of these symptoms before. Oh yes. How did you How did you come about to learn um, that you had pulmonary hypertension? Well, um, at first, you know, I've never heard of pulmonary hypertension. That there is the other high blood pressure, which is actually the uh, increased blood pressure in the blood vessels of mm -hmm. um, the lungs. So um, when I was diagnosed, you know, I'm totally like in denial, like, no, I cannot have a lung condition. You know what I'm saying? So um, when, when I found out the name of um, this disease, I just look it up. You know, I Googled it. <laughs> That's how I, yeah. I found out uh, the phassociation.com because um, all the information you, you wanted to know about pulmonary hypertension is you can just look at that website. 
And um, when I was diagnosed, you know, just like many other patients that got diagnosed with PH, you have no idea yeah. what it is and how you, you can deal with it. And uh, at first, you know, I actually sick uh, other um, patients, you know, and I found a support group in Orlando. Mm. And that's my first um, introduction to um, attending a support group. And I found out that although my doctor said, oh, you're one in a million, you know, local doctors told me you're one in a million, I found out there are many, um, you know, pulmonary hypertension patients. Mm. And, and so um, support group is very important if you got diagnosed because um, you cannot always um, Google things. Right. You have to actually talk, you know, to other <laughs> yeah. patients. Well, how yeah, exactly. how are they dealing with with uh, the condition? Right. Now, before you found out, you know, before you were diagnosed with with PH, I mean, did you have any clue that that this was happening in your in your body? That that because, like Angela said, it's it's very difficult to to catch. I mean, what were some of the things that you kind of brushed off and maybe overlooked? that well, actually ended up being a, a real issue? Um, I was very active. Mm -hmm. So any, anything that's happening, I was like in denial that it's happening to me, like yeah. getting out of breath, you know? Because uh, um, I, I used to ride bikes all the time. I even had uh, Century Tours, which is a 100-mile uh, bike ride. I did five of them. <laughs> wow. That was 10 years ago. <laughs> um, so having diagnosed with the lung condition is really a big surprise to me because I thought, well, how can it be? My lungs are strong. I have a big lungs, but mm -hmm. I guess uh, mine was uh, idiopathic. So that means I don't have any other condition that Angela mentioned. So right. for the doctors, they're also baffled, you know? Um, and again, just like what uh, Angela said, there are a lot of symptoms that is um, the same as other diseases like asthma. Mm -hmm. You know, my condition or my symptoms is like uh, shortness of breath, tiredness. You can name other diseases other than pH. That's the reason why I, you know, um, decided to have my support group locally in Lakeland because there's a lot of people or a lot of, there's a need for awareness, pulmonary mm -hmm. hypertension awareness, because a lot of doctors, and I'm talking about a lot of doctors, which um, 10 years ago, I have encountered some of them where um, other patients that I spoke with said that, oh, I was diagnosed for 10 years. They said I have asthma, mm -hmm. but it's actually pulmonary hypertension. And then when they finally diagnose it, it's already like on a severe condition. Yeah. Which, is, which is what you encountered. You yes. lived with it for we, many I lived, years. Yeah, I lived with it. I you know, keep on putting it off like I'm, I'm okay. Um, but doctors don't really look for it, yeah. you know. So having a pH awareness will not only um, inform um, people, will also inform doctors that if it's not asthma, if it's not this, you know, maybe you could check for pulmonary hypertension. Right. Now, Angela, Joyce talking about, you know, not really being aware Correct. that she had it. And you hear all this talk about, you know, doctors ordering up extra um, tests and things that are unnecessary, people self-diagnosing themselves okay. and all. Yeah. What do you do if you have a concern? You know, you don't want to jump overboard, but by the same thing, you don't want to ignore. Some of these little things could end up being a big thing. What's, what are some of the things people do? Becoming aware of the increased prevalence of pulmonary hypertension I think the more we look for it, the more we find it. And so by having, having brought the pulmonary hypertension clinic into our community has increased the awareness on the primary care provider's part. So they are not as, or they're more likely to look at it and, and to consider it. Maybe if somebody that's not behaving in a way that a normal asthmatic should, mm -hmm. maybe get the echocardiogram so that they can start looking and evaluating, are we seeing changes yeah. in the pressures there? That's a good starting point. And I do, I have seen 
with the introduction of the clinic in the community that the primary care providers are looking at it with a broader light and referring early, referring to a center that specializes in it so that it can be looked at and the details can be pulled out. And that way you can take a look and find out, are you looking at this disease or are you looking at pulmonary hypertension? And I think that that's where it starts out is, is increasing awareness out there in the primary care yeah. environment. Well, the great thing is, is that even though it's hard to catch and can be, you know, very severe when it's diagnosed, um, there, there is treatment for it. There is ways yes. to management. And we're going to talk about that here in just a little bit. But for right now, we're going to take a short break and we're going to look at Whitney Fung. She has some uh, stuff to teach us this month about nutrition. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hi, everyone. My name is Whitney Fung, and I am the Family and Consumer Sciences Agent at the U.S. IFAS Extension Service and the Board of County Commissioners Indigent Healthcare Division. Well, welcome back uh, to talking about some healthy lifestyle tips. Um, we are on the series of 10 tips for a good plate, um, and we're on tip number three, avoid oversized portions. We want to talk about large portions because that's what we tend to eat nowadays, right? Americans, when we go out into the restaurants and we, we get a plate of food, if it's not big enough, we don't think it's worth our money. So that's what we want to do though. We want to be able to avoid those oversized portions um, and we're gonna share some tips on how do we prevent doing that. So uh, a typical oversized portion may be something like this, right? And so if you're at maybe a potluck or if we're at a buffet or even at home sometimes, um, we might serve ourselves large, large portions of um, maybe too much meat, um, maybe not enough vegetables, um, and maybe not other types of fruits and things like that. So the main messages of, of a balanced, healthy diet is to follow something like my plate. And so my plate, we wanna have all five food groups every single day. So keep that in mind when you make your plate. And so in that oversized portion, we don't realize just how much we're eating every single meal, right? We don't sit there and measure it out. But if there are some tips that we can do to have small portions. One thing to think about, which is really interesting, is I have um, this ice cream, which I'm not taking it away, but we have ice cream. And if you look at the serving size, serving size is the kind of average amount that Americans used to eat a couple of decades ago. The good thing about it is that Michelle Obama has gotten it approved um, to change the nutrition facts label. We're going to update the serving sizes. What's interesting about this ice cream is that the standard serving size is one half cup. So how much is one half cup? And so I have my measuring cups here. It's this one, one half cup. Not very much, right? It's pretty small actually. Um, and so if you think about the scoops on your ice cream, um, it's not all that much. So think about it, you know, one half cup, how many calories are in that? How much fat is in that? And let's look at, look at this Oreo. In this Oreo, I did get reduced fat Oreos, but in one serving size, as in one sitting, how much am I serving myself for this food? For this Oreos, it's three cookies. So the average serving of the Oreos is three cookies. How many cookies do you eat or do we all eat, right? Hopefully not the whole bag, but I try to limit myself to one or two. Sometimes if I'm good, I'll have three. So. Um, that kind of, you know, satisfies your craving and you could still enjoy other foods. And that's the thing. If we end up splurging on all the bad foods or maybe other foods that are not as nutritious, we won't get the foods that we want to eat, like the fruits and vegetables. And so here's one, one example. And so if you have a pizza, not taking it away, um, but you know, what are the portions? Maybe one to two slices, you have that. And then I always, always think about what vegetables do I have every single meal? Whether it's carrots for snacks or grape tomatoes for snacks, I make sure I have my vegetables for the day. And you need three cups of vegetables every single day. And so here is an example. You know, if you have pizza, maybe you can make toss a salad for the family or um, just pop some of the frozen plain vegetables um, in the microwave or you could um, cook it in the pot or stove, um, season it yourself. But Simple little side dishes, right? That kind of add on that healthy part of it um, to, to your meal. Another interesting thing is go ahead and look at your kitchen. And, and I want you to, to look and see how big your plates are. Because plates 
affect your portions, right? And so um, I took these plates from my house, so they're really cute, but um, this is a small bowl, right? So a cup of cereal is the average serving, one cup. So imagine taking one of these of your cereal and pouring it into here. That's about one serving. How much are you eating, right? Are we eating like large bowls like this, right? Pretty, pretty large. Um, so one easy way to avoid oversized portions is to just cut down to smaller plates. And so I just have some, some examples here, smaller. I like them because they're kind of cute. So um, that kind of helps you enjoy your food too because you like looking at your plates um, and all those things. So, and also when you go out to eat, share your meal with someone or maybe um, ask the waitress or waiter to box half of it and take, take some of it home. Save it for lunch tomorrow, right? You can save money. Um, or you could um, order an appetizer or a soup or a salad for lunch, and that'll kind of help uh, prevent overeating too much as well. So um, tip number three, avoid oversized portions. Um, that's all we have for today. I'll see you next time. Thank you. For more information on this tip or any of the other 10 tips to a great plate, visit ChooseMyPlate.gov. Welcome back. In case you were just tuning in, we have Angela Mann from Lakeland Regional Health and Joy Morgan from the Central Pulmonary Hypertension Support Group here in the studio with us. Now, ladies, we were talking earlier about uh, how difficult it is to um, recognize pulmonary hypertension, this very elusive disease that can look like other things. And uh, many times when people find out, just like you, Joy, it was in a very severe, severe yes. state. But there is hope here. Tell us a little bit about um, what can be done to uh, manage this disease. Well, at this time, uh, 25 years ago, there was one medication. It was a 24-hour continuous IV infusion available. And it was a very difficult to manage disease. 24 hours? So you were basically hospitalized then? People could go home with small portable pumps, but it was a very life-limiting disease mm. and, and there was only one therapy available. Wow. Since that time, there are now over 14 different um, medications available in four different drug categories. They've really put in a lot of research into developing uh, different and identifying different pathways that we can treat this disease and now we're looking at this disease more in terms of a long-term management disease instead of a, a disease that you would die from within three to five years wow. of diagnosis and so the medications range from uh, oral pill medications one to five times per day they also range from uh, inhaled medications done in a nebulizer form to continuous uh, subcutaneous infusions like with an insulin pump type uh, device or continuous IV infusions. Medications are given based on the severity of the disease and also the underlying mechanism of the disease. So certain treatments are given if they have a certain underlying disease that also requires mm -hmm. treatment because that may be the reason for the disease. Say in the in uh, like clogged like the, arteries or things like no, that? No, not necessarily clogged be? arteries, more like the autoimmune diseases. So okay. if you have a scleroderma, treating the underlying scleroderma is very important in the management of also treating the pulmonary arterial hypertension. I see. And of course, Joy, you are, you are one of those success stories of how, um, how the disease has been managed. Tell us a little bit about your journey from being diagnosed in 2005. Well, when I was diagnosed, again, just like Angela said, there's only two available um, medication at that time. And uh, I was put on one, which is an IB, which is on a pump. It's a 24 seven, just mm -hmm. like what you said. Yeah. I went home, but then you have to maintain it. It's a pump, you have to put ice on it. And so it's an IV, so you got a catheter. It's like directly goes to your lungs. Now you, you were saying earlier that there are different classes of diseases yes. and you were put in one of the severe, On the right? severe, yeah. And, and um, you know, slowly but surely, uh, the medicine, I guess, kicked in after three years. It took a long time. This medication is not like, you know, an overnight thing. Mm -hmm. So after three years, um, my condition or my pressure um, started to go lower. My pressure when I was diagnosed is over 95, mm -hmm. which is um, the normal is 25. And you thought you were going to have to have a transplant yes, and everything. Yes, I was right? actually mm -hmm. on the list already. I was waiting for it until, you know, um, at the Mayo Clinic, which I, I, I used, um, I mean, I, my doctor was, it, um, I was um, on a clinical trial. And um, what they did is, 
when the the new medication comes up, they put me on a on a um, uh, an, an additional medication. Before, if you have pulmonary hypertension, they give you one medicine and see if it works. Right. Let's try that for six months and see if it works. You know, and usually, sometimes the medication takes a long time to kind of kick in. Mine right. took like three years, but then. Um, after I think I was on, on um, the IV medication for two years, and they added another uh, oral medication, which is brand new at the time. Hmm. And with the combination of that, they found out uh, through the clinical trial that it benefits the pulmonary hypertension patients. Nowadays, doctors can actually combine it, not hmm. only two, maybe three medication hmm. that uh, I know of other patients have um, and, wow. and that kind of like, you know, uh, together they found out that it helps the patient uh, live longer, um, you know, do more. And, and so, you know, um, after the IV, which is very hard to really be into right. because of so many uh, side effects, um, they took me off that after five years because there's another new medication, which is an inhaler, mm. you know, uh, through the nebulizer. And I would imagine coming from an active lifestyle like you had, mm -hmm. you know, uh, an athlete, a mother, um, you know, having yes the drip, the 24-7 drip is probably really extremely It's, it's very hard, you know. Yeah. I mean, just imagine you have to have that connected to you 24-7. Mm. If you took it off, you're going to die in a few, I guess, minutes. It's your lifeline. Wow. Yeah. When you take a shower, you have to cover it with shrink wrap. Hmm. It's, it's just dealing with it on a daily basis yeah. and with the uh, uh, side effects that, you know, I, we probably don't have enough time to mm -hmm. tell you, but I am just so glad that I got transitioned. You know, some other patients have different side effects. So right, I'm sure each body each, is a little one, bit different. Yeah. Each, each and each different. medication, a pH patients have its own, I mean, they, they react on it differently. Some will work for, right. with the other, some doesn't. That's why the doctor has to really figure out which one works for one person. It's not like, you know, yeah. everybody will have this. And it's a constantly changing science, isn't it? I mean, it like is. It, and, and it's great that we have a facility like Lakeland Regional Medical or Lakeland Regional Health that has a facility here yes. locally. With an active vested interest. Mm -hmm. What makes it work for Lakeland Regional Health is that we are a multi-specialty and it takes a multi-specialty, multidisciplinary approach to identify and treat these folks. And so it takes having a team of primary care that's aware of the disease. Yeah. It takes a team of rheumatology watching their patients that have these autoimmune diseases. Uh, it takes a cardiology approach. It takes a pulmonary approach. And it takes uh, uh, education to the emergency medical mm, services. Absolutely. It takes education to the emergency departments and it takes education and specialties pharmacy care while you're inpatient at the hospital. And that's one of the things that we brought together was putting all of these resources together, getting engagement and everybody so that mm. we could be this incredible team and provide the care right. that we want towards these folks. You've heard the, the old expression, ignorance is bliss, but when it mm -hmm. comes to your health, um, ignorance is the worst possible thing that you could Correct. do. I mean, yeah. pretending like, oh, I don't wanna know because if something's wrong, I don't want to know that it's wrong. I mean, that's just a ridiculous mindset right. to have. Um, along those lines, what are some of the, uh, I mean, how do, how do people test to find out if the symptoms that they're experiencing are indeed pulmonary hypertension? So one of the first tests that's very important is what's called an echocardiogram. That's an ultrasound of the heart. It's done externally. It helps to give a look to see, are you having any problems with your heart, the physical structure of your heart? Are we leaning more towards a problem of systemic hypertension that could be causing a reflection of high pressures or valvular problems? Or should we look into the right side of the heart? Once we decide that we want to pursue it a little bit more, looking for those underlying diseases like the autoimmune diseases, looking for underlying things like sleep apnea, chronic low oxygen levels can certainly contribute to it. Mm. Uh, identifying other sources. 
it's it, to an extent almost a diagnosis of exclusion. The final and most diagnostic test that it's the gold standard test that you have to have in order to actually get the diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension is called a right heart catheterization and that differs from a left heart catheterization in that the left heart catheterization will go in and assess the arterial system going up and inside the left side of the heart and it actually looks at the blood vessels of the heart. Whereas a right heart catheterization looks at the pulmonary venous system, it goes in through the vein, goes up, feeds in through the right side of the heart, and actually is able to occlude a pulmonary artery and look at the pressures. Mm. And that gives the definition there. It's at that capillary level that we make the decision or the definition of pulmonary arterial are hypertension. These, are these tests very invasive? These are very invasive yes. tests. And mm. so it is a, that's why it takes the collaborative effort of right. having a cardiology team on board to help with the testing when it's deemed necessary. Uh, there's a lot of supporting data that goes into it. A typical application for a medication can run anywhere between 20 and 50 pages of documentation wow. just establishing the diagnosis. Wow. So it is a, a difficult to diagnose disease as well. Um, in part, want to know that you're treating the right disease. These medications only treat pulmonary arterial hypertension and so if they're given to patients that have pulmonary venous hypertension you actually have worsening mm -hmm. of the symptoms so it, it has to be a very specific diagnosis now with <laughs> the with the symptoms and the diagnosis and the testing I mean is are there certain groups of people that are I mean is is are there certain races is it a, is it a certain gender I mean are there certain people that are more susceptible to to this disease? Historically we've seen that the age group between 30 and 60 in women seems to be have a higher prevalence mm -hmm. of the idiopathic disease. Again looking at the autoimmune diseases particularly scleroderma, lupus and sarcoidosis or, uh, and uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Those would be the most high risk mm -hmm. populations to really heavily screen for. Now this age group of women this is also a, a, a child rearing age yes. uh, yeah. so I mean and, and that probably places a lot of stress on on the lungs and and that whole pulmonary system. I mean, wh how does that factor in? One of the things that we have found is that it's a population that does tend to uh, tend to their families and not themselves, and right. so the symptoms do go undiagnosed and underlooked at. And if you think of a 35-year-old woman coming in complaining of fatigue and being tired and a little shorter breath, and she's 20 pounds overweight. They are often diagnosed uh, as depression and often mm -hmm. diagnosed as um, out of shape. And so it's underdiagnosed and underlooked at in, in that population as well. Wow. Because other things look like it. Now, Joy, having gone through the experience of, you know, realizing these symptoms maybe a little bit at a time and then all of a sudden and the diagnosis and going through, what are some of the things that you might tell uh, folks watching? to encourage them to get tested or the things that they should look out for or if they've been diagnosed, how to get in touch with a support group? Well, um, first you just find a support group in your area. Um, go to www.phassociation.com. I think that's, uh, yeah, association.org, I'm sorry. Org, okay. Yeah, and then uh, just look for a support group. There's like a map of America and okay. then just go to your state. So it's just that easy. B B yeah. H B or P H Association dot org. Okay. P H Association dot org. Find your location on the map yeah. and call them up. And um, just like what you say, you know, um, to add to that, um, mine I always tell my members of my support group, information is power. So research, read everything that you can on PH but don't overread it though because sometimes yeah. they they go to this uh, website and they get scared more yeah so um uh my advice is uh find a support group find people that has the same condition and then you know and you can talk to them and um one of the most important thing is also find a ph center hmm. well that's about all the time that we've got for today i've learned so much um thank you ladies for coming on and sharing with us and, and educating us on, on uh, PH. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. That's all the time we have for today, but you can catch this episode of Picture of Health all month long at 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. on PGTV, or watch all of our previous episodes on the Polk County Government YouTube page. I'm your host, Stephen Barnes. Thank you for joining me on this month's Picture of Health.